All right, y'all, we're wrapping up seminar 10 tonight. And I want to start with some basic review, kind of like where we've been, what we've got under our belts at this point. And at any point in what's happening tonight, I want you to feel completely free to just chime in and say, pause, can you please review that concept or, or whatever. We've already been over a lot of this stuff multiple times, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time rehearsing it. I'm just going to prod it out. And as always, um, with uh, diagrams as we go. So here's the basic riff where this seminar starts. The question of anxiety is a question of desire. That's why we've spent just as much, if not more time, addressing Lacan's notion of desire as we have anxiety. And the study of desire is not a psychology. You'll recall, it's an erotology, where the key theme here is not the psyche, but the body. Eros, of course, being the origin of the word erotic. The study of anxiety is a study of desire. And the study of desire is not a psychology, but an erotology instead, because it deals with eros, with bodies. And that is the central theme when it comes to anxiety. It's about desirous bodies encountering each other and demanding some sort of a bodily response or activation. Now, when we first got into desire, we talked about need, demand, and desire, and about how desire is demand minus need, what's left of demand after need has been met. We talked about how this results in a split subject using some early graphs of desire. We also came up with some fuzzy math to help us remember this. One plus one equals three. And the reason why we say one plus one equals three is because the split subject is not just comprised of an embodied, animalistic, biomaterial self, it's also comprised of a disembodied, abstract, sociolinguistified self. There's the you in your skin, and then there's the you on the screen underneath your image right now at the level of your name. Now, one plus one equals three because there's always a third element. The split subject always has a third element, and that third element is the bar that you see racing across the S. That third element is the minimum irreducible distance that has to be maintained between your bioanimalistic self and your sociolinguistified self in order for these two to remain distinct. That gap, that bar, is signaled in Lacanian algebra with little italicized A. One plus one equals three because the split subject always has a cut or a gap that has been introduced into them. And we symbolize that gap with this little a. We've come at this a couple other ways as well. We had, for instance, a very simple math problem, a division problem, where the mythical subject of pure need is divided by capital A. And what is produced, if you just draw a simple mathematical equation, you've seen this before, it's also posted on our Instagram, is a split subject remainder A. Split subject dot A is how we signaled it in our time together. A is a remainder, a corporal leftover of the process known as castration. And we'll review that again here in a minute. We also talked about desire in terms of its for, of, and as structure. First and foremost, desire is always desire for another body, somebody else, their care, their affection, their attention. In order to have our desire for another met, though, we learned very early on to approximate the desire of the person we hope to provide us with care. We guess what they want 
and then identify with that in hopes of better securing their affection. This is desire of in order to satisfy desire for. And the process that we talked about here is one in which in the final analysis, we wind up learning how to desire as another. We have to desire as another in order to get our desire for another met. And the example of this that you're not going to be surprised to hear me repeat again is getting dressed in front of a mirror. Looking in the mirror is one of the things that everybody on this call has done today. There are a lot of other things that some of us have done and others haven't. Looking in a mirror, though, I guarantee everybody on this call has done it at least once, probably multiple times today. When you look at yourself in the mirror, what you are doing is you are examining yourself from another person's point of view as you imagine it. You're imagining how the little other here, an imaginary encapsulation of the big other sees you. And the basic question in front of the mirror is, am I attractive? Which is to say, will I attract the affections and the care and the attention, the recognition that I seek from this other person? Do I look agreeable enough to have my desire for them met? Now you'll know, in order to answer that question, you have to look at yourself from their point of view. And that's what the mirror provides. That is desire as. And then you look at the wardrobe that you're choosing. You're choosing clothes that you think will make yourself appear agreeable to the action you want to attract. That is desire of, because you're approximating what you think they're into when you choose your outfit. And in this unique combination of dressing in a way that you think will make yourself appealing and then viewing yourself in this clothing to test whether you've achieved your goal, desire of and desire as, you eventually, ideally, for better and for worse, get your desire for another person met. This is another way that we came at desire. And I spend a few minutes with it because it was also how we transitioned to this imaginary triangle that was all premised on the desire of the maternal figure or function. Remember, it doesn't have to be your bio mom, doesn't even have to be a female. What we're looking for here is somebody who performs a certain function for the child, usually that of a primary caregiver. Here, what we see is the child desiring attention from the primary caregiver, but having to approximate and imagine what else the primary caregiver likes to guarantee that desire getting met. What they imagine the primary caregiver liking, we have symbolized by the lowercase fee, the imaginary phallus or the imaginary object. Then we introduced this fourth element, not the child, not the maternal figure, and not the imaginary phallus, but this fourth element that transforms the imaginary triangle into a symbolic square. This is the paternal function, the name of the father, the no of the father, the prohibitive gesture that cuts in to that relationship between the child and the maternal figure to say that the maternal figure does not have the phallus and that the child cannot be it for her. What that does is it negates the phallus. It places it under erasure. It introduces a cut. It is the act of cutting in that then produces the opening that we designate with little a. So if we're going to put this on our board here, it's gonna look something like this. All right, holler back, because I can't see you now. Can you see the board here in front of you?
I need a voice. Are you drawing? I don't see any. I see just a white screen space. I don't know. It just loaded. I can see your Skype screen. Now can you see the blackboard? It's still thinking. Oh, Lord. All right, let me stop this and then we'll try it again. Because I do think it's helpful to have some of the symbols popping for us and in front of us to be seen. All right, how yeah. about now? Yeah, now we got it. OK, great. So the imaginary triangle that we're talking about here was this thing. And then we introduced this symbolic element represented by the paternal function. And what I'm trying to get at now is to remind you how this works, how this looks mathematically. Imaginary phallus is then placed under erasure. And this yields is an opening that we designate with little a. And in order to help us remember this, we've come up with another simple math problem. One minus one equals zero. And I'm not just messing with this to remind you that the one here is symbolized by the phallus, which of course refers to that biological one that sometimes dangles between two legs. And then having this very one subtracted to give us a symbol for nothing, which is exactly what little a is, a symbol for a place where nothing appears. This is why Lacan in this seminar has made so much of zero. There is a lot of zero talk in here. It's tempting to think that this is fundamentally a seminar about the big other, capital O. But what Lacan is also careful to point out a couple times in here is that don't confuse that big O with its relative zero. Oftentimes he's talking about the zero here. Now what I want to emphasize here while we've got the board in front of us is something else. This is something we haven't discussed, but something I want to suggest here in our final session together. The cause of desire we have talked about as object A, this element right here, this opening, What I would like to suggest here is that the cause of desire is in fact a contracted moment that includes the cutting in of the paternal function and the resulting opening that's produced as along the way. So here's one way to think about it. There's the incision, and then there is the wound. There's the cutting as an act, and then there's the opening of the human form that is resulting from this. These two elements together, these two moments, mark a contracted event, a structure, if you will, that I would like to suggest is the cause of desire. And in fact, one of the things that we have discussed in symbolizing desire is that it looks something like this. When the imaginary structure of castration gives way to the highly symbolized designator for something that resists symbolization itself, this cause of desire. When the cut meets the opening, you now have a cause of desire, but it's a contracted multi-part moment, I'd like to suggest. Which brings us to another point that I wanna make with y'all. What we're talking about here 
is not objectivity, but instead what Lacan calls objectality. It's another great move that's happening in 10 that we've talked about here. Objectivity has to do with objects, with the field of stuff, the couch in the room, the painting on the wall. Objectality has to do not with stuff, but with causes. It's about causality. And if you want some ways to sum this up, objectivity is about objects and objectality is about openings. And Lacan's point here is that modern science is fascinated by objectivity, obsessively, almost even psychotically intrigued in a delusional way by stuff, by objects. Lacan's point is psychoanalysis does it one better because it focuses on the conditions of possibility for something like an object to appear. So if the object is a coffee mug, what Lacan is going to talk about are the divisions and the differences, the differential relationship between the coffee mug and the wall behind it that allow the coffee mug to be singled out as an object to be studied. Now that differential relationship also comports with our fuzzy math. One plus one equals three. The cup plus the wall and then the gap between that allows them to exist and to be studied by modern science as two distinct objects. If there were not a gap between them, an opening between them, cup and wall would merge with each other. The field of objects would slip back into something that looks a little bit more like the here and now of the all in the process of becoming that Lacan talks about in the 50s. So what we get when we focus on the cause of desire, the cut of the paternal function and the resulting opening in which a child can pursue their own interests and enjoy a little bit of breathing room is not objectivity. What you choose to focus your desire on, the objects you choose to consume, to purchase, to fill your closet with, is not of interest to Lacan. He is interested in the object cause of your desire for that stuff. What is the experience of lack that led you into that consumer moment? What did you feel like you were missing that led you to that purchase? You see, there are many things, remember, that we lack but that we don't experience as loss, right? You don't have a tail, but you don't wake up every morning and experience that lack. Lack is an experience. It's something that has to be undergone, which is why you have industries like advertising, departments of marketing in big corporations and small. They are charged with the task of producing and manufacturing, distributing the experience of lack. You didn't know you needed a new iPhone until you saw that billboard. You didn't know what you were missing until it was thrown up and displayed to you there in traffic as you pass through the dead zone where your current phone seems to putter out. The cause of desire is always an opening that we experience as fillable, in need of filling. The study of this is called objectality, Lacan says. It's the study of causes, not the study of objects. Which brings us to anxiety. When anxiety happens, something is made to appear in that opening that is the cause of desire. 
something is made to appear in the place of nothing. Where nothing was, something is now made to appear. Where there was an opening and a gap, some breathing room, some distance between the emergent desires of the child and the devouring desires of the maternal figure. Now something is called in and that gap and that opening closes and it's filled not with an object of your desire. And here's the tricky part, but with someone else's desire. Someone shows up with a bigger desire than yours and says, and you know what I want? I want that gap, that one that you cherish. This is the parent that shows up on a pissed off day and takes your fucking bedroom door off the hinges. There will be no gap. And you're like stunned, not just because the door is not on its hinges, but because it's fucking gone. Dad, what did you do with the door? Like it's not just missing and out of place, it's gone. It's completely gone. And as a result, the gap can't be returned. The barrier can't be reestablished. Anxiety is what happens when something is made to appear where otherwise nothing would be allowed to exist. Now, what is it that is made to appear here? in what I still believe to be some of the most important pages of this seminar, pages 45 and 46. What Lacan tells us here is that the desirous other wants me to display, to signal, to signify for them that I lack. And not just in order to close my object day, not just in order to, to fill that gap. It's something else. They actually want me to show up as castrated. That's what they want. They don't just want my opening. They want me to reenact the cut that produced it. They don't just want to see the scar. They want to hear one more time how you sustained the wound. That signal that is made to appear in the opening that is the cause of your desire is a signal of your castration. And we represent that by the parens minus phi. That's the sign that they want to see again. So when we symbolize anxiety, I'm going to share again this screen. What we see is something different. Here is the cause of desire. Where the cut of the paternal function results in the opening of object A. When anxiety strikes, we see something different. Anxiety is what happens when the A is marched back to the act that produced it. It's a reversal of the process of desire. This is how anxiety assaults desire. It takes the object cause of your desire and says, I'm not just gonna, I'm not only going to operate on this, I want you to show me this part of it too. Tell me, and show me again how this occurred for you. Show me your castration. Signal for me that you are castrated. Now, this was the example that also got us into sadism and masochism. You'll recall here, when God in Ecclesiastes commands enjoyment of life, of job, of work, of life. It's in order for us to fail. We cannot enjoy all of these things because we are castrated. 
and yet we are commanded to enjoy. And when we try to enjoy unheeded, unbiased, sometimes in search of this drug-addled experience of limitlessness that we all somehow seek, whether it's in music, in spirituality, in sex, in drugs, rock and roll. You just keep going down the list of things that are supposed to put us outside ourselves, ecstatic experiences. In each of these cases, you have to ask yourself what we're actually seeing. And why so often these experiences crash against the rocks of castration. We cannot enjoy as Ecclesiastes commands, which is why God is a sadist. Because what God is getting off on in that moment is seeing just how poorly we are able to follow that command. And when you stumble, when your hope for ecstatic experience smashes against the rocks of castration, the resulting shipwreck is that signal. That's the signal of your castration that the sadist seeks. It's not enough for you to want to enjoy. You have to want to enjoy, try to enjoy, and fail to enjoy. It's because you can't love your partner and enjoy them every single day that God commands you to. Do you see? The commandment is issued in a sadistic fashion because what God wants to see, according to Lacan, is that we are unable to enjoy the way that we are commanded to do. And that visuality of it showing up as castrated, as a shipwrecked motherfucker, is exactly why God is sadistic, because that is a highly anxious position to be in. What the big other, as desirous other, lacks is a signal of my castration. That's the bottom line here. This is why Lacan talks about a lack of lack. Something is made to appear where lack used to be, and as a result, lack is now out of the picture. There is no more breathing room, because now you're caught up with the struggle and the failure, predominantly, to enjoy. This is in part why we've symbolized anxiety, as we have in here, with the following formula. The desire of the subject as caused by this opening known as object A is gobbled up and displaced by the desire of something bigger, larger. And again, recall the praying mantis. Let's pause there for some questions. Tell me where you're at and let me know what I can clarify, if anything. I'm gonna try and keep an eye on the chat here so you can post stuff there as well. And I think I'll be able to keep track of it. All right, if you're good, I'm good. I have a question real quick. Yeah, go ahead. 
I was talking to myself for like a good minute there, um, but now I'm muted. So, um, so I'm curious about, we're talking about openings, right? I'm curious if you would say there's sort of a dialectic between openings and closings um, in, in such a way where perhaps not necessarily that we're filling these openings, but they close on occasions or something like that. Yeah, and if you think about this in terms of wounds, um, it would have to be a closure that leaves a trace. So it's not just a closure of an opening that would produce a seamless result, but a closure that would look like an opening that's been plugged where you can see the lines around it. And in that case, Lacan would say, yeah, that's 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 what we're talking about. So closures leave traces just like cuts result in openings. That's partly why he's messing around with cause and effect in the readings for tonight. He's really trying to get after cause and effect because he wants to have this really robust theory of objectality, the study of causes and openings. But yeah, what, what would be happening in this dialectic of desire and anxiety, if we could call it that, and I think that we can, in fact, I think one of the most profound things we can say at this point is that anxiety must be passed through for desire to realize itself at the level of the drive. That's why we have this table where desire is here, anxiety is the median element, and jouissance is up here. So if you think about this, let me throw the screen up again. If you think about desire in this way, so we have this table, right? Classic table from this seminar. This is also the table that gave us the like vortex spiral thing that we were messing with in our fifth lecture. You have desire, anxiety, and jouissance. Initially, I thought this table was kind of bogus, but after working with it for a while, I think it's actually pretty productive if you read its flow like this. Now, I'm not going to rehearse all of the things that we attribute here, the need, demand, desire, and I'm not going to rehearse the whole swirl again unless you want me to, but I think that's pretty clearly expressed. What's important here is that at the level of desire, we see this movement. At the level of anxiety, I've told you that the movement is reversed from having a cause of our desire that is an opening. Anxiety says, tell me how you got that cut again. Let's talk about how you're castrated. Show me that. I want to see that. When Lacan says that jouissance must be refused in order to be attained on the inverse scale of the law of desire. This is at the end of his essay on the subversion of the subject. This is in part what he means. This green arrow here is the law of desire. In order to arrive at J1, at jouissance, there's this kind of, I put quotation marks around here because this isn't actually jouissance. Jouissance is an effect structure an opportunity structure produced by the subject's integration into the symbolic. What was before that integration up here, the subject of pure need and a whole big other, was not jouissance. It was the here and now of the all in the process of becoming that again Lacan talks about in the 1950s. But in order for this desire anxiety dialectic to play out, if we're working this Here's A, here's B, and here's the sublation in jouissance. What we see is a reclamation of the very process 
at desire. Do you see how this looks dialectical, but with a hitch? Except at the level of the drive. So what's happening down here at the level of desire is renewed by this process of passing through anxiety at the level of the drive. So we're gonna spend some time talking about this. This is in part also why as we were discussing this matter last time, I asked you to pay close attention to Lacan's use of the word wellhead when he says that anxiety is the wellhead for jouissance. And you'll recall the use of wellhead made sense there because desire was illustrated by nursing, anxiety was illustrated by vampirism, and vampirism is here the wellhead for a certain type of enjoyment. So remember, the nursling desires milk, you could say, to the extent that you could assign desire to a nursling. At the level of vampirism and the anxieties, cultural and otherwise, that surround it, what you see is a passing over, not into more milk, but this is after milk has run out. Now, if it's a desire for anything, it's a desire to drain the lifeblood, the very source that would be able to produce more milk to satisfy future nursling desires. The vampire isn't satisfied to take a bit from mama. The vampire wants to take it all from mama. What Lacan is trying to signal here is that the passage from desire to anxiety at the level of the oral drive in the case of nursing, desire is happening where, for a breast that is full of milk and always renews its supply. Anxiety is anxiety around the fear that the breast will eventually dry up and there won't be any milk left. And vampirism comes in as an opportunity to take something else, another life force, in this case, blood. All of this metaphorically gives Lacan this idea to say that anxiety is a wellhead for jouissance, for something more extreme. Nursling, milk, vampire blood, and then we get this wellhead. This is what we're after tonight. This is what he's after at the end of this seminar. What comes next? What is outside anxiety? What is beyond anxiety? It is a resurgence of the formula of desire here represented for you, except at the level of the drive. And I think, yes, you could read this as a dialectical movement. Is that clear? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's awful. Um, I guess I understand. So that for the for the the table that you sort of charted out, you have the same two terms. They sort of contradict each other in the next um, uh, in the next uh, articulation of them within anxiety, and then you have the same two terms in the same place as desire and jouissance. But I'm still curious how that plays out? Is Jouissant sort of the intractable contradiction of desire in that sense? No. Jouissant is at the, operating at the level of the drive is a partial satisfaction of desire. You see, the thing with desire is that it can't get no satisfaction. It's ever moving, restless. It cannot be sated. At the level of the drive, it can, but only in moments and only partially, which is why, in part, the drive has a repetitive cycle. 
you don't just smoke one cigarette and throw the pack away. You don't just have one drink and then leave the beer on the counter. You see where I'm going with this, right? You don't just masturbate once and then be like, cool, did that, what's next for life? And similarly, in the event of masturbation, you don't just touch it once. It's the repetitive movement that allows for the drive to operate. And it's repetitive in part because the satisfaction of desire that it provides is partial, incomplete. We'll come to that. It's absolutely on our horizon. One more step in between. But before we take it, questions, comments, things I can clarify so far. You're good, I'm good. Just to maybe self-evident based on what you're saying, but so if anxiety is, a, is if anxiety suggests a beyond anxiety, then is anxiety a universal at that point? Is it like the depressive position? Is that like a, is it being posed as a necessary universal that we all must go through? Oh man, that's a great question because I hear different things from Lacanians on this point. So, and you, you can hear this too through some different forms of analytic technique where they talk about the patient needing to go through an anxious moment with the analyst, that anxiety is kind of like this moment that has to happen. And I read Lacan several times in this seminar as kind of saying that, as suggesting that this is a passage, a rite of passage on the way to the end of analysis, that in order to get beyond desire, you have to confront anxiety which means you have to have this encounter with a fucking praying mantis. And the key thing here is, remember, the praying mantis example, the sadistic God example, the key variable here for anxiety is you feel that you are caught up or implicated in the desire of the big other but you don't know what you are for that desire. So the praying mantis example, you know what she does when she wants to fuck, but you don't know whether you're about to get fucked and thus killed or just passed on by. Because if you're wearing the male mask and this desirous praying mantis shows up, you're about to be fuck killed. If, however, you're wearing the female mask, she's just going to pass right by. Anxiety is the not knowing which mask you're wearing. And Lacan's point is that it's oftentimes so excruciating that the beyond of anxiety becomes an acceptance of destruction. He says people would almost rather assume that they're wearing the male mask and about to be fuck killed then deal with the not knowing, even though it's the not knowing that preserves the possibility that you might just get a pass from that praying mantis. Anxiety is that painful. And you may also recall other places and other techniques that suggest, and hell, you know what? I bet half the people on this call see this all the time in the first couple of sessions when they meet with a new patient. They show up and they're trying to figure you out. What do you want from me? And they may even put it like that. What do you want from me? I've come here, I, I'm telling you what's on my mind and you're ignoring me. You're not, aren't you gonna write any of this down? Like, isn't this the shit you want me to say? Don't you wanna hear from me that X, Y, and Z? That what do you want from me moment in the early stages of an analysis is kind of like anxiety. I know you want something, and I know that you want it from me because we're the only two people in this room. 
but I have no idea what I am for that desire. So why don't you just fucking tell me? You know what's wrong with me and you know what you want, so why don't you just come out and tell me? And if we want to universalize it further, we might also read this into interpersonal relationships, intimate relationships, where the conversation, argument, however you want to call it, devolves into what do you fucking want from me? You told me to do this. I did that. What the fuck do you want from me? You're still unhappy. I did what you said. This is what you told me to do. What the fuck do you want from me? The true answer to that question, as we learn in the subversion of the subject essay, is I don't know. I don't know what I want from you. My desire is as opaque to me as yours is to you. And that's almost a scarier place to be. Because remember, the neurotic is going to be somebody who says, oh, come on, big other. I know you know deep down what it is you want. So let's just come out with it. Here, the enigma of desire, the obscurity of one's relationship to the object cause of their longing. is completely avoided and displaced at the level of the demand. Enough of your desire, tell me what you want. Issue a demand. The neurotic, rather than deal with the enigmas of the other's desire, will do everything they can to press the other to deliver a demand instead. And you'll recall, this is also something that comes up early in the seminar. Lacan says, though, the subject can push the big other from desire to demand, issue a demand, tell me what you want, tell me what you want, only so many times before they reach the bottom of the barrel of demand, the D0, as Lacan refers to it, at which point the big other can only say what the neurotic hoped the big other wouldn't say, which is, show me you're castrated. You want to know what I want from you? You want to know what I want you to do for me? I want you to tell me the story of your castration one more time. So the great horror that the pervert embraces in the graph of desire when they turn from fantasy up to a signal of the lack of the big other is also what the neurotic tries to avoid when they turn left out of fantasy if you're looking at the graph of desire and back down into a world where the big other has all the answers here at the level of the demand so if you look at the graph of desire this is exactly what you see It's in part how we can read this. Here's desire over here. Here's fantasy. When the cookie of fantasy starts to crumble, the subject has two options. The pervert fully embraces any signal that the other lacks and is like, let me plug that hole for you. I'm the plug for your hole. The pervert is very quickly going to make this move. This is the move, however, that horrifies the neurotic. They would much rather pass from here back down into a world where the other has all the answers. You know this world. We've been there. This is the recursive cycle of demand that Lacan talks about. The neurotic endeavors to try and stave off what deep down we all know the big desirous other actually wants. Show me. Show me that you're castrated. I don't just want the cause of your desire. I want you to signal to me the cut that 
opened that cause. Show me the stumble. Show me your fall. And there's a simple answer to the question of why this is so difficult for the neurotic. The neurotic is somebody who has a strong ego. Unfortunately, there are techniques out there that want to make that ego even stronger, which is why Lacan is so down on ego psychology in his day. The ego for Lacan is something to be hacked back, cut through, ignored, fucked with. That's not what the ego wants. What the ego wants is to be a subject, whole, complete, self-sufficient, in control. I'm the ego. What the ego papers over with this gesture is the fact that they are not a subject, but in fact, an object. That they are not autonomous, but in fact, heteronymous. That, in other words, they are not these self-sufficient, independent, coherent beings, but instead split subjects. What the ego papers over is split subjectivity. And the cause of split subjectivity is castration. That's why Lacan says that in fits of anxiety, what is made to appear where the object cause of our desire used to be is a signal of our castration. And it's difficult for the ego to show up like that because that is precisely what the ego works so hard to ignore about itself. Now, this is not a lecture on early to mid 50s Lacan where he's really working up a theory of the ego. The best riff on this for my money, you can delve into the first two seminars. They're great, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But his manifesto on psychoanalysis, the function in the field of speech and language and psychoanalysis from the mid 50s, that's the essay to read. If you're looking for that summer read and you really just wanna know at root what Lacan is doing with psychoanalysis, it's all right there in what we now know as the manifesto for Lacanian psychoanalysis, the field and the function of speech and language in psychoanalysis from the mid 50s. In there, you get terrific riffs on how the ego operates, why it's so fragile, all the traps that occur in analysis when the analyzand shows up and asks you to validate their ego in more than one way. That's a topic for another day. And if we wanted to do a whole series where we're just reading key essays in a Cree, we can do it. Now, Bruce Fink has done a great job of this. You can read great essayistic commentaries on what Lacan is doing in some of these key moments in his writings in a Cree. Um, one of the things that I've been doing, as some of you know, is delivering a series of lectures around on minor essays in a Cree. The major ones have been covered, but a lot of the minor essays, there's still some weird shit happening in there. People don't talk about it. People don't read them. People read the biggies and then they dip. One of the biggies that's definitely worth the read is this essay from the 50s, this manifesto where he works out the ego. So I'll leave that there as summer reading for you. Uh, but just to know that this regressive cycle of demand is pursued by the ego function, which the neurotic subject has in spades. That was another great question. I see in the comments here, David says, not universal cause, the psychotic doesn't experience the psychotic what the other wants delusionally. Mm. That one's directed at you if you're looking at the comments. I saw that. I just didn't have the du dual mental capacity to track with you and figure out what the fuck to make of that. <laughs> make of that. Um, I'm yeah. not sure. Um, 
When you say not universal cause, is cause here short for B cause? Or are you talking about causality? Short for B cause, I'm reading it, but I want to be clear. B cause, yeah. Okay. So anxiety being not universal to the psychotic because they don't have to grapple with desire, is that reason? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, but here's the thing. I saw a guy on the corner the other day. So I live in downtown San Francisco, the Mission District. There's all kinds of crazy shit going on here. And the homelessness stuff is off the charts. Mental health issues are off the charts. The substance abuse is off the charts. I saw a guy the other day standing on the corner in a bathrobe, clearly struggling, shoeless. But what he was struggling with fundamentally was a newspaper. It's been extremely windy in the Bay Area. And as I'm riding by this guy, I get caught up the light. So I'm like, you know, giving him an eye. I want to see what's going on. He's got this newspaper and he's trying to read it ostensibly. And the wind keeps whipping it. And so he uses the wind to fold the newspaper. And then he holds it up like a flag and lets the wind kind of flap it along. And then he chops it with his hand to produce another fold in the newspaper. And it was almost like he was struggling to fold this newspaper against the wind and moving in a kind of slow motion fashion, the likes of which I've only ever experienced in a nightmare that we often refer to as an anxiety dream, where I'm trying to get somewhere and I can't get there. I'm trying to walk down the stairs and I'm stumbling. Now what Lacan's gonna say is all dreams, especially nightmares, are going to have these elements of bodily fragmentation because that's where we all started. Deep down, we know we are still fragmented bodies looking in the mirror, discombobulated as we were at the age of six months. Deep down, we are not only split subjects, but fragmented bodies, just a pile of parts that are relatively incoherent. And Lacan says, the truth of this appears all the time at the level of the nightmare. The nightmare is one usually in which your body is falling apart. Your world is falling apart. Your motor skills are dissolving. What I saw in the case of this person who struck me on surface as psychotic was that they were living an anxiety dream. It wasn't just like it happened last night and now we're back to reality. It's like every fucking day of this guy's life, I imagine, is that anxiety dream. He lives that anxiety dream. Now, can we call it technically anxiety? I don't know. But that experience of bodily discombobulation that we usually refer to as an anxiety dream, not being able to get somewhere, impediments of every sort, is one that it would seem accessible to the psychotic. But let's pause on that. We still got ground to cover tonight. And I wanna also let you know that I have a whole series of lectures that are being transcribed right now on seminar three, on the psychoses. They're gonna be posted on YouTube soon. So you can read Lacan's seminal work on psychosis. And if you need help along the way, it's all tagged by chapter. So if you read a difficult chapter, you can go to YouTube, click on ideally, click on the lecture and have some guidance through that chapter. I'm not saying it's gonna be good guidance, but I'm saying it's gonna be there. So hold off on the psychosis stuff. I know you all are interested in that. Um, I promise I'll deliver some lectures and I'll post them for you so you can watch them. And eventually we'll have some transcripts out as well to circulate. I haven't looked at the transcripts yet, I need to still determine how significantly a pile of shit they are before I, I, I put them on the interweb. You're right, though, um, Oliver, that castration is a precondition for anxiety and the psychotic utterly rejects castration. Yeah, the name of the father is um, almost perfectly foreclosed by the psychotic. I see David's got one more typing up here. 
I see you now. You're coming back to this point. Um, yeah, that's the thing. Trevor does know what God wants from him. He knows he's God's wife. He knows that God wants to fuck him left, right, and sideways. He knows this. Now, I don't know if we could say that it's knowledge. Because he's operating in the field of religion. He has knowledge of what the other wants. What I know about psychosis from Lacan and knowledge is that it really turns more on, on the privacy of that knowledge. The truth of the psychotic's knowledge, the vitality and viability of what they, quote, know, is propped up by the fact that only they get to know it. So, example, the psychotic hears a voice in their head. They know that you don't hear that voice, but they do. And you can see this all the time walking down the street. Motherfucker be having a moment on the corner and you walk by looking half civilized and they quiet, you know, maybe even button up a shirt and be like, hello. And then as soon as you round the corner, you hear them right back getting after their dead mom or a God or a Colonel Sanders or whoever the fuck they're talking with. Now, they know that you can hear them. What they also know is that you can't hear the voices that they hear. What that proves to them, though, is not necessarily, or let's just say not just, that they know what God wants, the aliens, the NSA, but they know that God, the aliens, the NSA, only wants it from them. The fact that they can hear the voice, but you can't, is proof that they're the chosen one, not you. There's no doubt that the voice is real. And that certainty is propped up by the psychotic's knowledge that they can hear what you can't. So knowledge for the psychotic is a weird fucking place to be. And it hinges on a kind of like solipsistic privacy and a relationship to certainty that's very different from the neurotic. This is all stuff that I cover in my commentaries on seminar three. Put a pin in this, hold off. I promise I'll hook it up soon. Are we good to take next steps? Where do we find ourselves? We have time for another question or two if somebody's got one. Oliver's got something cracking. I have one. Um, how does Lacan interpret anxiety when there isn't another present? So like I'm thinking about, I have friends who can't smoke weed because they get anxiety attacks just chilling in their room by themselves. Like what does Lacan make of anxiety yeah. without another present? Man, that is so interesting, right? Because it does hinge on this question of psychosis. And because we know that one of the subclinical structures of psychosis would be like paranoia. But we also know that there's this debate among Lacanians about whether you can have bleed over between clinical structures. You can have the underlying clinical structure of a psychotic, but show up as a neurotic for lots of your life. But the challenge here is what do we do in a case like the one described, where it's a regular person smoking weed, presumably neurotic, but then having a fucking paranoid moment. What Lacan is going to say about the big other here is also what he's going to say about mirrors. You don't need to actually have one in the room to have the experience of being before one. So part of what we know, for instance, about the ego ideal, symbolized capital I, next to capital A in parens. It's in the bottom left-hand quadrant of the graph of desire. Note, I'm not talking about the ideal ego, which is the speculative image. I'm talking about the ego ideal, which is an introjected understanding of the law and order of the symbolic. It's already inside you. We might refer to this as conscience. It's certainly what props up or provides material 
to the super ego because the ego ideal is full of all the expectations and rules and regulations and standards for, I don't know, being a woman, being a man, all the things you have to live up to in order to meet those gendered categories, in order to satisfy the requirements. But here's the deal. Nobody is ever man enough. Nobody is ever feminine enough. And as a result, the ego always feels like they fail to live up to the ideals of society. The ego never lives up to the ego ideal. The super ego rushes in as a punisher to say, look at you, you fucking failure. As a censor, why don't you get your shit together? It's that voice inside your head that says, be better, be faster, be stronger. You suck. This is proof that you suck. Look at you, you fucking mess. We all have these voices in our heads. Lacan's point is that that is a voice of the big other, of the symbolic, of society that has been introjected, brought inside, and now does the work of censorship and constraint that the symbolic on its worst days does for those it's supposed to otherwise contain and, and help give identity to. So even though this person's getting high by themselves and having a fucking paranoid moment, the big other is always there. It's always already there. By the time you can roll a joint, the big other is there inside you. It doesn't need to show up as a praying mantis, as a desirous little other. In other words, an embodiment of the big other. The big other as such is never going to walk up your driveway and knock on your door. It doesn't work like that. It's society. It's principle. It's law. It's order. Law and order aren't going to come and hit you over the head with a stick. But a cop will. A cop is a little o other that has embodied or at least been allowed to embody the authority of the big other. And that voice inside your head is also a little o other that has come to embody the big o other's standards. So even if you're by yourself getting high and there is no praying mantis-like body in the room, you can still have that paranoic moment. And I would just add this as well in answer to the question of whether there can be crossover between the clinical structures. The ego has a fundamentally paranoic structure. What else is narcissism but an attenuated form of paranoia? And here's the deal. I'm not making this shit up. This is what Lacan says. The ego is fundamentally paranoid. And you see this pronounced when the ego gives way to the narcissistic capture that it usually operates on, whether or not it has a mirror in front of it. So what I want to suggest here is that there's a continuum between neurosis and psychosis that can allow for extreme fits of anxiety for those friends who can't smoke to the point of even seeming like this is anxiety on the verge of paranoia. So I say this as in the spirit of dialectical response to what we heard about the psychotic and their experience of anxiety as a living nightmare. Now here what we're talking about is the neurotic and their experience of paranoia. A neurotic structure, anxiety, finding expression at the level of psychosis, and a psychotic structure, paranoia, finding expression at the level of neurosis. That strikes me as truer to Lacan's system. I cannot speak to this clinically. I can speak to it conceptually. And that's my job here, is to show up and help with the conceptual stuff in hopes, and this is my great hope, that you all will then take some of this and help other people. All I would want is for one person on these calls to take one element of Lacan and use it 
to help a patient, whatever it is, to help a friend. I don't even care. But I know that the people that are here are clinicians practicing and aspiring for the most part. And, and, and my goal is to just bring some of this as much as I can to an, an additional resource available to you. And I think the great contribution here is to know that a lot of the forms and functions that we see happening at the level of psychosis have attenuated variants in the field of neurosis. And some of the forms and functions that we see in neurotic personalities, according to Lacan, find extreme form in case of psychosis. I think that's it. that's a fairly um, uh, true statement. I see one more question here. Does anxiety unveil the omnipresent other of the symbolic for the neurotic who has sublimated the other into themselves? What the hell kind of question is this? Does anxiety unveil? Already this thing is fucked up. Already this thing is like mind warping. Does anxiety unveil? And it's in quotation marks too. David, you're an amazing fucking asshole. This is great. I love it. Does anxiety unveil the, or whoever typed that, that's the thing too. It's like, it's Cody and David on the call. We don't even fucking know who it's Cody. Cody's got the book over his face, but it's under David's name. You guys are a couple of amazing assholes. Okay. Does anxiety unveil the omnipresent other of the symbolic for the neurotic who has sublimated the other into themselves? Do you mean reveal the omnipresent other as a neurotic or does anxiety allow a neurotic subject to see the omnipresent other in a different way? Uh, more than seeing, I was thinking, that even if the uh, neurotic has forgotten the other, anxiety somehow allows it to show up. That's great. And what I like about it, too, and, and I see now in some sense why you've put unveil in question marks, because it's a very Heideggerian way to spin this around the question of concealment and unconcealment, veiling and unveiling, um, closure and disclosure, covering and discovering, all these Heideggerian moves um, where he suggests that anxiety is going to give the ordinary person a brief fleeting glimpse of the truth, of the nothing that they are, and of the bullshit that is society. The problem, though, is it's so brief and so fleeting in Heidegger that we, we then get this return back to, oh, it was nothing. You recall that passage famously from Being in Time. When anxiety strikes, the neurotic is going to respond and say, oh, that was just nothing. And Heidegger's point, again, is you're exactly right. That's precisely what just showed up in your life. You just got a glimpse of it, and here you are shrugging it off. If we're going to read Lacan in this way, it does bring him into line with this tradition from Kierkegaard to Heidegger, um, a very existential phenomenological tradition in which anxiety provides access to a kind of authentic existence, as they used to put it, um, and, and produces things like um, authentic speech. Uh, but um, I don't know how much of that we can get out of Lacan here. What we do know at this point is that anxiety is going to put us on the path to something more enjoyable, something that does have a little more truth to it for the subject and the field of experience, analytic and otherwise. So I think there is something to be had here. Um, my goal in the second half of our time tonight is, to gonna, is gonna be to see how close I can come to, un, to unveiling that for us. I don't know that I'll be able to, but I think there are some key passages that we can see. Um, is there a revealing that is a revealing? You know the answer to that question. The answer is yes. And I'm just going to treat it as a yes or no question. So the answer is yes. Amazing. Yes. Um, in fact, run the etymology on veil, veal, and by veal, of course, I mean the meat. Okay. Uh, what time is it, y'all? I've got 7.25. Do you want to take 10 now and then come back? Okay. Take 10 and then come on back. 
and um, and we'll spend the second half working on the drive, this field of jouissance that is beyond anxiety. That's the goal. More in a minute.
All right, y'all, welcome back. It's 7.35. <clears throat> and I want to start by jumping back into the formulas that we were just messing with here on um, our black erase board. So as you can see here, we've got desire mapped as such. Anxiety marches this backwards. Jouissance reverses the cycle again, except at the level of the drive. So let's see if we can put ourselves on some forward movement here. At the level of desire that we were just showing here, castration is experienced as something negative, as a subtraction of sorts. And it's negative in the sense that it leaves us lacking. Castration leaves us lacking. And as a result, it leaves something to be desired. In other words, it leaves us desirous. Castration at the level of desire here, formulated on our blackboard, is experienced as a negation. Castration is a subtractive process. When anxiety comes along, castration becomes something positive, a positive signal, and it's not for us any longer. Now it's a positive element for someone else's desire. And because this negation has been positivized, if you will, it does not leave us lacking. It does not leave something to be desired. We are not left desirous. We're instead left without lack. Where lack was, now something has appeared, a sign of our castration. <clears throat> and this feeling is not desire, but anxiety. And then here at the top, what we have is a reclamation of this negativity, where this, neg this positivity has been negativized and marched back to this zero, if you will, which might be more helpful here even than a positive or a negative that is object A. You might say that here's the negation, here's the positivation, and then here what you have is this mediating function of A redeemed as zero. This remainder element, if you will. Now, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about this A. It is one of the central themes of this seminar. And it's at this point in Lacan's seminar that object A takes on properties of the real. And here's how I want us to understand that once more, is that when the subject of pure need, the baby, is developmentally brought into the field of the symbolic, with all its norms, rules, languages, and codes, there's always part of them that cannot find expression in the symbolic. There's something in there that resists symbolization. And this is the brute materiality of the subject of pure need. This is that bodily scrap or that corporal morsel that is ejected from the symbolic. Not to say that it lands on the outside, but that it's buried under shit on the inside. It's an extimate element. X meaning out, timate part is referring to intimacy. There's something extimate about this experience. <laughs> and again, because object A is always first and foremost something bodily, a corporal morsel, a remainder of the process, a bodily remainder of the process um, known as castration. It's no surprise that desire, which is caused by this entity, is bodily. It's the desire of a body for another body. Lacan uses the expression, for instance, um, I want your heart, which can be an expression of love. I want you to love me. But of course, in traditional Lacanian terms, we read it to the letter. I don't just want you to love me. I want to reach inside your fucking chest 
and pull out the organ that sustains your body. I actually want your body part, literally. And not just to enjoy it, like to the point of enjoying it as you die. So think about this with the vampirism example too. Um, I've told you earlier that the drive is somehow caught up in this. Now what we want to do is focus on how, because I've told you that the jouissance that is reached outside of anxiety is desire satisfied partially at the level of the drive. So what is the drive? The drive is a partial satisfaction of desire. Each drive is anchored in an erogenous zone that is effectively an opening in the human body. And it always, the drive, moves out and around in a circuitous way, a partial object that is always at some level a body part. It's a, it runs a repetitive circuit of enjoyment around a partial object, which is always a body part. This is how the drive operates. And here's what I want to suggest to you in one of our final moves of this lecture series. If desire defends against anxiety, the drive outstrips it, delivering us over to jouissance. If desire defends against anxiety, the drive outstrips anxiety. It outlives anxiety if you read Deleuze. And this is why Lacan is putting all of the drives, the four basic ones, on display at the end of this seminar. In each case, oral, anal, scopic, invocatory, the four basic drives, we see a way to seed partial objects to produce little A's that the drive can then circulate around. Whether your drive is oral, anal, scopic, invocatory, or hell, even phallic, Lacan, at the end of this seminar, is turning towards all of these other ways that little A's as bodily scraps are produced in order to cue up the drive. And you'll remember seminar 11, where we're going from here, one of the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis discussed in seminar 11 is the drive. He's got it on his mind at the end of seminar 10, and it becomes a central theme in seminar 11, which is partly why we're gonna read 11. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this one more time, how it happens. The subject of pure need, this presuppositional, wholly embodied being that we know we all were at one point, is asked to find their place in the symbolic, in the big other, a world of law and order and language. What happens in this moment is that the highly embodied experience of the subject is brought into a signifying dialectic in which something is separated off, sacrificed. Lacan refers to this as a pound of flesh. What's cut out of the body is in many cases the body itself, usually though as a pile of parts. Little a, object a, designates this pound of flesh for us. It's what's been cut off in the process of integration into the symbolic, known as castration or alienation. It's an irreducible remainder of the ordeal of castration the division of the subject, resulting in what we refer to as the split subject in and by the symbolic. Whatever else object A is, here's what we need to know about it. It is some body part, even if it's another part that refers to your body part that resists signifierization. It's tough to talk about. Little A symbolizes what is lost in by, and I would say most importantly, on the symbolic. Object A is what is lost on the symbolic. And all who operate at that level. Again, what we see in this seminar is Lacan associating object A with the real. 
is what remains of the subject after the advent of split subjectivity in the field of the symbolic. It's an irreducible real element. That's new. That's new in seminar 10. I'll say it again. Object A. It's what remains of the subject of pure need after the advent of split subjectivity. That's where you're going to find object A. And there are lots of them. Yeah. The drive I've told you is a partial manifestation and realization of desire. Every drive circulates around a partial object, and all partial objects are stand ins for object A. That's why we're talking about this. So, what I want to do instead of yammering, I want to do a little bit of drawing here. You know how we like to do it. So, what I'm going to do is, per usual, I'm going to save what we've got and start again. Don't forget the theme in psychoanalysis is say it again, say it better. So here's a quick riff on the drives. Let's see if we could just chart some of this stuff out. There's a drive. Four in particular get a lot of attention. And they all are popping at the end of the seminar, which is why I'm dealing with this. Here. Oral, anal, scopic and invocatory. The drive is an operation and they each emerge. From a specific erogenous zone. <clears throat> and again, all these erogenous zones have similar structures. They're openings in the human body that usually, no, I'd say always, have a rim-like structure. <clears throat> in the case of the oral drive, it's the mouth, in particular, the lips. Anal drive, it's the ass, particularly the anus. Scopic drive, it's the eyes. In particular, I'd say the eyelids, but we can just write eyes here. And invocatory, it's the ears. Invocatory here has to do with speaking and hearing, speech and hearing. Each drive is also going to have a partial object. Some physical element that stands in as a representative of A. The object cause of desire at the level of the drive gets attached to a specific object. In the case of the oral drive, the stereotypical object, you know, is the breast. So if there's an oral drive here, you will find stand-ins for the experience of lips seeking out a breast. The anal drive, the anus, the partial object is shit. Feces, that's the partial object. If you have an anal drive, what you will see are shitting-like functions where the product is treated as some sort of a strange gift, all the more so the more obsessive you are. The scopic drive, the partial object that exists as a manifestation of object A as the cause of desire, is the gaze. Now remember, the gaze here is not a position where somebody's watching you from. It's a position of being seen, potentially being seen, whether or not you're being seen or not. The partial object of the invocatory drive, as you heard me just say, is the voice. Now, each drive is also going to have a series of verb tenses that go with it. And the verb tenses are going to be active, passive, and reflexive. And here's what that means. The verb that goes with the oral drive is sucking. <clears throat> and the way that works is <clears throat> if you have an oral drive, <clears throat> what you get off on 
is the active process of sucking. It can be like smoking cigarettes, for instance, drinking. The passive experience of being sucked, I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. And then the reflexive experience of, wait for it, sucking on oneself. Now, I'm not saying that you're going around giving your arms hickeys and shit. The oral drive here could be manifested at the level of nail biting. Any sort of auto cannibalism that we engage in on a regular basis, that time when you tasted your own blood just to see what it tastes like. This reflexive voice is to suck oneself. You will get off in some way on eating parts of yourself, ingesting them through the lips, kissing yourself, licking your fingers after you're eating. Those are all reflexive verbalizations of an oral drive. You know people that lick their fingers. That's the oral drive at work. Now, I'm not saying that they're licking their fingers because they've had them on breasts. The breast is just like an original partial object around which the original manifestation of the drive at the level of the lips typically circulated. There are lots of stand-ins for the breast, the drink, the cigarette, and before it, look at the trajectory from nipple to bottle to pacifier to thumb. Notice this, the thumb sucker is somebody who gets off on sucking themselves. And the thumb sucker can oftentimes become the nail biter. This is the drive at work. Now we can go on. The anal drive with the anus and the obsession with feces. You know the verb here. It's to shit. Lacan spends a lot of time in these last few lectures here talking about the anal drive and the commandment, the demand that the big other issues to the potty training child, which is shit. On the one hand, hold it, and then shit as a commandment. The, stopic, the scopic gaze is to see. If you have a scopic drive, you get off on viewing things. You may be a photographer. You may enjoy going to art museums. You may enjoy a good sunset. Instagram could be your medium. You also are going to enjoy being seen. You don't just go to Instagram to look at others posting beautiful things. You oftentimes like to see who has liked your posts, who is actually enjoying watching you do what you do online. And then reflexive too is not just looking at others' pictures of themselves and enjoying the way that they like yours, but yourself liking your own images. This is, for instance, somebody who may have an Instagram profile that is dedicated to a series of lectures on a slightly obscure psychoanalyst who then goes to their personal Instagram account after posting at the lecture site and then immediately likes what's just been posted. That would be a reflexive verbalization, if you will, of the scopic drive, the drive to see. And then, of course, down here with the invocatory to hear. So this is somebody who enjoys listening to music, always has their headphones in, actively listening all the time. This is somebody who also loves to yammer. Here is the lecturer, for example. It's also somebody who enjoys being yammered at in the passive voice who likes being talked to, but also somebody in the reflexive voice who enjoys hearing themselves speak. Now, some of the things that have come up in our seminar here have to do with the scopic drive. In fact, it's probably the drive that gets the most attention in this seminar. Here is the chapter on Buddha's eyelids, the Bodhisattva statue that has eyes that deliver a kind of gaze. Um, here's also talk of the smudged mirror, for instance. The thing to note is that all of these are gonna be openings in the human body. 
All of these, in other words, places where cuts emerge, and all of these are going to be partial objects standing in for that little a. And to pursue these drives, the wager here is not just to defend against anxiety, it's to outstrip it, it's to overcome it, to reclaim in the field of partial objects exactly what anxiety tries to take from us. Now, before we bring this into focus for Lacan's final works here, where he has this very strange archway that looks like the St. Louis arch, where he puts the drives, I want to just pause for a second and take some questions here. What you've got here is just a crash course on how the drives operate. They're partial manifestations and satisfactions of desire achieved by circulating around these weird partial objects that are always stand-ins for body parts that have been cast off, set aside, subtracted from the subject. You see, the breast is the original partial object for the oral drive because it is what is cut out and subtracted from the subject's experience in the process of weaning. Shit, feces, is the partial object of the anal drive because what else is shitting but taking a part of your body and cutting it out, snipping it loose, and setting it aside, getting rid of it. The gaze, remember, you don't have the gaze. At most, you are its object. It's a place remote from you from which you can be seen. We can go on and on, but the point here is that all of the partial objects around which a drive repetitively runs its circuit are bodily elements that are cut out, subtracted from the human experience of the split subject. Now, that's why they line up with object A, as that irreducible bodily scrap, that pound of flesh that is removed from the subject of pure need when they pass them through the symbolic. That's how these two phenomena link up with each other. It's why Lacan is featuring the anal, the scopic, the oral, and the like at the end of this seminar. Because he's trying to get us back in touch with all the ways that the split subject is constituted in the locus of the big other. And in that process, has some bodily scrap of theirs shut down, ejected, removed, cut out. And now we start talking about all the ways that you can then refine, relocate those partial objects at the level of a hand to be sucked, at the level of a cigarette to be smoked at the level of nails to be bitten. You see where I'm going with this? This is the oral drive being played out. So let's see where you're at with this before we start plugging it into the end of seminar 10 with this new graph. All right. I don't want to slow down. So let's keep going here. We're going to save this one. Even though you can find this a very similar map of this elsewhere. In order to draw the one that Lacan trots out for us. And the page number in question here. It's at the start of one of the final chapters. Get a couple glimpses of this thing. Yeah, check out page 294. That's, I think, the clearest place where we see this thing coming about. Page 294. 
He gives us five. Five of these elements. And now let's see if we can chart them out here and complexify what it is that he's given us, because I think that's an important move for us to make at this point. So we've got this archway that looks something like this. And down here you've got the oral, which is laterally connected to the superego or the invocatory. And I'm writing invocatory here in place of superego because remember what we talked about just a few minutes ago about the ego ideal as the voice inside, the voice of conscience that links up with your superego as that great punisher. Here we've got the anal which is in turn laterally connected to the scopic. And then at the peak, at the top of it, we've got this really important drive of the phallic. Now what I'd like to suggest so far is that these lateral connections here illustrate a certain type of plane. What you see down here is a vocal plane, where the invocatory drive is always linked backwards in a regressive way when it does regress to the oral drive. Here's where you see speech, here's where you see hearing. Here are the lips that talk, and here's the ear that receives. You see where I'm going with this? Up here, what you have is what I would call a visual plane. You might even say that this is temporal down here and that this is spatial up here. The scopic drive is always connected regressively when it does regress to the anal. The desire to see is always somehow linked up with the desire to shit. There's a reason why every shit you've ever taken has been witnessed by yourself. But we're not going to get too far into that. What we want to do is just start fleshing out these categories. So here we have our four basic drives. And this fifth one that Lacan introduces up here is the phallic drive, is what's going to correspond for us to this trajectory that gives birth to desire. From castration to the emergence of object A. What happens up here is the emergence of lack. This is our 1 minus 1 equals 0 here at the phallic. And it is the turning point in this graph. What we can also add are some elements down here that describe what was happening before and what was happening after. The oral and the anal drive are all are both connected to the field of demand. And the scopic and the invocatory drive are typically characterized instead by desire. Now you can see why desire would be on the right hand side of this graph, because you can't have desire until lack has been experienced and lack has been emerged. It's only at the phallic stage, and you can read these developmentally if you like, the oral stage, the anal stage, the phallic stage, whatever. It's only with the emergence of lack that something like desire can come into focus. So that's why we have desire on this side and demand on the other. Demand, though, is here in a simple way. We don't need to make this complicated. The oral drive <clears throat> at the level of the nursling is very much a demand <clears throat> for the other. Bring me that breast. Bring me that food. Here, the subject demands food from the other. 
Lacan talks about it as need in the other, <clears throat> but it's more accurate, I think, to think of it as demand. The oral drive is fundamentally a demand for something to put in your mouth from another. And it's something that you need to nourish yourself. It is a demand for food. I'll put food in quotation marks because obviously food isn't the only thing that you demand from others in order to put into your own mouth. Here we see demand for something to ingest from another. <clears throat> the demand is issued from the subject. Demand for food from the other. At the level of the anal, we see something different. Lacan talks about this as demand in the other. What we see at the level of the anal stage, especially when we get to potty training, is the others demand for not something to be nourished, not something nourishing to put in your mouth, but something poisonous, hazardous to be ejected, some ejecta. So here's how this works. The oral drive has a demand built into it. It's the subject's demand for something nourishing, for food from the other. The anal drive also has a demand built into it but it's a demand issued by the other to the subject. And it's the other's demand for shit from the subject. I put shit in quotation marks because we're not just talking about poop. We're talking about all the things that shit can morph into, symbolic and otherwise. Here we see the other demanding at the stage of potty training for you to shit exclamation point. And now is the time to poop. So I don't need to go into details here for us to see the experience where the child is told in the car to hold it, hold it, hold it. And then as soon as they get in the door, the child starts to pee a little bit and the parent freaks out and says, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And then finally gets into the toilet and says, okay, now go, now shit. It's a demand that the subject produce something. And if it goes well, you know what happens. The primary caregiver jumps up and down, cheering, giving the kid treats, positive praise, positive praise for the production of shit. This is why all gifts are fundamentally shit. Because the original gift was the gift of shit. It was the first gift that each of us gave to the other. And they thanked us for it. And it was utterly and truly worthless to the point of being poisonous. And nevertheless, they thanked us for it. That's why we have phrases like it's the thought that counts, because in the end, you know that the product, not the thought, but the thing that you were given is always just a pile of shit. It's the thought that counts, not the shit you were given. So with this, we start getting a little bit of the framing here. What Lacan also adds here at the level of the scopic, he says this is might in the other. At the level of the invocatory, he's going to say this is desire of the other. And the reason why this absolutely matters is because we know what the desire of the other looks like here other in question is another we've seen. The superego does go down here. As Lacan puts it, up here at the level of the scopic, you would see fantasy. This is the rudimentary chart that starts popping out. And each of these four or five positions, remember, this is where you see a split subject being constituted in the locus of the big other. 
Each of these suggests a way to do that. Now we're about to add to it, but let's hold up for a second. I want to return back to the group for questions. I'm going to keep the chart up. Let's talk this through before we add anything more. You have to know we're getting into it now. OK, then I want to keep going. What I'm about to add. Is probably going to strike you as fucking odd. But I wouldn't be giving you your money's worth if I didn't. Here. At the start of this thing, and I do want this to be. The start of this. Is another experience. Here we see the uterine experience, the origin where you have a mother and an individual to be wrapped up in themselves, connected in this very unique way that mammals are known to be connected. Then you have this radical moment of birth. Here we might call this pre-birth. In this radical thing known as birth, we see a certain experience that occurs that we traced out last time, where the placenta, the child, and the mother gradually come apart. What I want to focus on here, though, is something a little bit different. What we see happening at birth is the beginning of a dialectic that will characterize each of these four or five phases. There is an in action and an out. The in that happens at the moment of birth was re revealed to me by a midwife buddy who I think has delivered like half the children in Norway. And I asked her, what's the most amazing thing after you've delivered thousands and thousands and thousands of babies? For real, legit thousands. What still amazes you? And she said the most amazing thing for her is that these children can be born and go from a world without air in the sense of spirit, if you will, and then emerge and immediately take in this breath. Inhalation, the first breath, is for her still the most amazing part of that experience. That a kid could go from having gunk in its lungs and being in the gunk and as the gunk to becoming this vascular being with an opening known as the lungs and this intake of air. Lacan is on to this. He says even at the origin, the child's first breath is an inhalation of an other environment. The inactivity of breathing in air is breathing in an other environment. And the out here on page 326, I'm not making this shit up, he says, is what happens next. And if it doesn't happen next, right, people in the in the in the delivery room freak out. After that inhalation, what's supposed to happen next is the cry. The child is supposed to cry. The breath that goes in comes out as the vocalization of discomfort, of whatever. Lacan says here that the cry that comes out is a little object A. It's a detachable object, a bodily remnant of the child. The cry is a yieldable object. 
And that's what's cracking here. Every out in these dialectics is going to produce a yieldable object. And this yieldable object is a partial object. It is going to be a little a. You want to know what he's up to at the end of this book? This is what he's up to. He is tracing out all the different yieldable objects that are bodily, that give us figures, maybe even prefigurations of the object A that we're eventually going to see emerge properly in the field of the symbolic. You have to hear this. Object A is what I am. In each case, what the child is giving up as a yieldable object is something that they are. So let's keep running this through. The N at the level of the oral here is going to be nursing. The out process is going to find expression in the technique known as weaning. And the yieldable object, YO for abbreviation, is the breast. Here is your object A of the oral drive. The partial object around which the oral drive circulates is always a stand-in for the breast that you yielded in the process of weaning. In, out, yieldable object. There it is. Let's just keep going. Let's call this, this is like our Bob Ross moment. I'm just gonna make some happy little dots up here and see what happens. The end moment here, in the case of the anal drive, is that famous expression, can you hold it? The holding in of shit that occurs in the experience of potty training. Potty training isn't just about finding a good place to let it out. It's also about knowing how to hold it along the way. The in process of the anal drive involves a holding of it, a holding of it in. Maybe you're very good at keeping secrets. Congratulations, you're very good at holding it. And then the out cycle of shitting. And the yieldable object here is also the partial object around which the anal drive runs its circuit. Shit. Feces. Moving over here to the scopic. In. Out. Yieldable object. <clears throat> In, what it feels like to be you on the inside, fucked up, fragmented body at root. Nevertheless, what you're constantly putting out for others is not a fragmented body at all, but a specular image of you just doing great. This is you looking your best self. This is the specular image. the image, the gestalt that you see in the mirror. The yieldable object here, you know it, it's the same partial object around which the scopic drive circulates. It's the gaze. The, position are, the positions around you from which your presentation of self as put together can be seen. And as a result, the part of you on the inside that feels like a fragmented body can be overlooked. This Lacan says in our seminar here is a proper A. 
And the shit over here, he says, he doesn't put it in these words, but I am, is a proto-A. So the connection here between the anal and the scopic is key. Shit or feces is a proto-A. And after the phallic stage, the gaze is going to become a proper A. So here it is again. The specular image here is me, my body, as seen by you, where the cause of my desire, all the gaps and cuts and ruptures of which I'm made are masked. They're hidden. They're what Lacan refers to over and over again at the end here. They are misrecognized. And we could go on with our ins and our outs and our yieldable object here, which would be the voice. But I think we've done enough to get to the next stage. Pausing again for questions before I clear this board in order to fill another. I am moving fast. Go ahead. Uh, question per se. I just find myself wanting to figure somehow triangulate or, or superimpose the registers over the top of that schema and see where they land. Yeah. But I feel like it's a three dimensional chess kind of intersection. I don't think it's right. It's not a flat map. Yeah, I mean, it, it's super tempting. And, and maybe what you could do is you could find a symbolic, real, and imaginary element in each of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that could be a way to do it. And and what you would, the real would always be connected, at least at this little level of it would be connected to that object A. So the yieldable object is always going to be a real object. It's going to be something that is nasty, that is pr that's private, that we are embarrassed by when others see it, um, that can also often serve as a great site of, um, of um, erotic interaction. So like think, we're talking about lips, anuses, eyes, and ears. So think about all the ways that eyes, ears, lips, and anuses connect. And you can start to think about it like that. Um, the phallic, I mean, I guess kind of speaks for itself, but it's important here because it's it's the turning point from a field of demand to one of desire. Because it's at the phallic stage that we get castration, the name of the father, that symbolic square that pulls us out of the orbit of a demanding other and a demanding self <clears throat> and puts us into the field of society, which is a field of desire more than demand. For us and for Lacan, the most important thing up there right now is the scopic drive. And so I think it might be worth us like really focusing on it because listen, he doesn't know about Instagram in the early 1960s. He doesn't know that shit. He knows about TV. What we are seeing in seminar 10 is one of the original approaches to visual culture. The way that he ends on the scopic is important for us because the basic drive of late modern society is a scopic drive. There's a reason why it's called Instagram and why its symbol is of a photo of, of a camera. Facebook also suggests a field of visuality. <clears throat> Twitter is interesting because it suggests a vocalization. To Twitter was like to chatter, to kind of like yammer on in, in speech that would have sound, but very be very shy on sense. So Twitter was birdsong, right? But it was also something that gets associated early on in modern culture with um, empty speech. 
with someone that just rattles on and doesn't know what they're saying. They have a lot of sound, but there's not a lot of significance in there. So bird song is an example of that. You can hear it, but it doesn't speak to you, if you will. Um, anyway, that's that's the chattering mind, but we can talk about that later. For us, though, the scopic drive is where Lacan ends, and I think we should honor that, um, especially given that the scopic drive is the dominant drive of, of late modern uh, Western society. We got time for another question, though. What's up? All right, we're going to do this. So we've got this, this beast, whatever this thing is. We'll save it. And we move on. What I want to do now is focus on the scopic drive at the scopic level, as Lacan puts it. And it's, it can be basic. It can be as simple as an eye looking in a mirror. The mirror here represents the big other. It's the position from which you're seen. And having reflected back to it, or reflected in the mirror, depending on how you put it, a specular image. The mirror is a speculum, right? What you see here is a gestalt, it's a narcissistic image, and it oftentimes captures the eye. We're looking at this ourselves in the mirror, and what we see is a whole body. And we're captured by this. One of the ways I told you that we can start getting at little a is to say that it's what is on the back of your mirror. It doesn't appear in the reflection. It's what's on the back. And I don't think it's any coincidence that in the math theme or the algebraic symbol here for the specular image, you can see a little a contained. The specular image contains in a masked, misrecognized way the cause of your desire. So what we see here is that little a in the scopic moment is typically alienated, misrecognized, and hidden in the narcissistic capture of a specular image. And this experience tills the soil for desire. This is what desire looks like, where the cause of your desire, the part of you that can't appear on the mirror, remains hidden all the more so, so that you can focus on what you want. You don't have to think about why you want. Instead, you get to focus on what you want. Something different happens when anxiety strikes. Anxiety is what happens when you're looking in that mirror It's the same mirror. And as we discussed last time, something appears on the mirror. It's a smudge, it's a smear, it's the food bit that flew out of your mouth while you were flossing and got stuck to the mirror. And what that does is it calls into question the narcissistic capture that your specular image invites you into. This corporal morsel, literally a morsel of food that flies from your body and gets stuck to the mirror, is a sign of our brute materiality, of the fact that at base we're basically animals. In this moment, the A is no longer behind the mirror. Now it's on the mirror. And that A is now made to appear. It's no longer something subtracted from the field of experience. It is now there and present. When this happens, when this thing shows up, it shows up as a sign that we're not all there. 
we're not nearly as coherent as we'd like to think. In fact, we are still those castrated beings. What we have here is not desire, but anxiety. So Oliver, check it out. You're in the mirror with yourself and nobody else. The bathroom is all alone. There you are, whether you've smoked a joint or not. And there's that big other in the position of the mirror. And it shows up in a way that causes anxiety by forcing, even in this opportunistic way where Floss has just flung food on the mirror, by signaling what you as an ego can't bear to admit that you lack and you lack because you're castrated. That's what shows up on the mirror. The smear is always the smear or the trace of the imaginary phallus that's been placed under erasure. That's what these parens indicate here. It's still there, but in a smudged, rubbed out, if you will, fashion. Notice, this is also why we have the praying mantis as an example. Page six, he could not see himself in the insect's eye. The very start of this, this element that people often overlook. Page six, I couldn't see my own image in the enigmatic mirror of the insect's ocular globe. This is a mirror that doesn't reflect back as it's supposed to. It's reflecting back problematically, not like a regular mirror. And what else is this? But that statue of the Bodhisattva that Lacan encounters in Japan that looks like it has eyes staring back, but in fact, it's not there at all. There are no eyes in that image. And yet we think that it is. That statue is a mirror in which nothing is reflected. And that is precisely what is reflected in the brown smudge on our blue mirror here. This is a mirror that no longer reflects unproblematically, or better, that reflects among other things, among other objects, nothing, a no thing, a trace of the no that is our own castration. This is what we're up to with objectality and the split subject, the cause of desire. What you see smudged on the mirror is not just little a, not just a sign of your castration. It is evidence of what you are. That's what's up with object A. It's not just a part of you that's been cast aside so that you can get on with your life. It is you. That's you, man. You're not the reflection in the mirror. You're the piece of food that just landed on it. That's the important conclusion here about object A. It is what we are. And we've got a couple more turns to make, and it's only going to get weirder. But where we're going to end is with the discourse of the analyst. So I want to pause for a second, make sure we're cool so far. Remember, all this is recorded, so we can always come back. You can check this stuff out. Eventually, there'll be transcripts as well. All right, cool, let's go. Here's what we have so far. What the subject of pure need is, is an embodied being, an animal, an enunciating subject, a subject of need, however you wanna put it. But what the subject is as an embodied being can only enter the world of human togetherness, the world of appearances, the symbolic, as an irreducible remainder, some corporal trace or leftover of what Lacan calls the ordeal of the symbolic, this process of castration, which we playfully symbolized a while ago. Subject of pure need divided by the big other produces a split subject with a certain remainder. Here is what we're after right here, this remainder, this corporal leftover, that embodied part 
of the split subject that can't find its way into the symbolic. But here's the deal. This irreducible remainder, this cause of our desire, in order to locate it, we cannot find it at the level of our desire. Our cause as desiring subjects is always foreign to our status as desiring subjects. Don't forget, it is you, but it's a part of you that has been cut out, set aside, placed under eraser, hidden behind a swimsuit, flushed down the toilet, wiped off the mirror. Think about how fast we move to hide those corporal morsels when they pop up. The first thing you do when you see somebody staring at your teeth is wonder if you've got something in them. And the first thing you do when you find out you do is immediately get rid of it. Turn the other way. Get angry at them for not telling you sooner. This A that we are is us, but also foreign to us. Our cause as desiring subjects, again, is always foreign to our status as desiring subjects. You can't find the cause of your desire in the field of desire. The best we can do, and if you've got ears to hear, we are now starting to talk about the analyst. The best we can do is march or trace our desires back to their causes, back into, as Lacan puts it on 337, what is irreducible in the function of the A. What this does when we march our desire back to its cause is it allows us to realize that we're not infinite subjects of desire, but finite objects in a material world. Here I'm still working with page 337. A material world that's alienated, just like us, in the field of the other, a material world known as the real. We are not infinite subjects of desire, but finite objects in the real. And that's what's at stake when you march your desire back to its cause. And what do you do when you get there, when you arrive at the object cause of your desire, at that partial object that was the cast out object that allowed you as a split subject to emerge in the field of the other. What do you do when you get there? Lacan's answer is clear, you name it. Only by naming this, by coming to terms with the cause of your desire, can we surmount anxiety. Or as Lacan puts it again on page 337, only by doing this can we push beyond the limit of anxiety. He also says on page 337, hint, hint, read page 337, that in this moment we are open to love because he says there is only ever any love when there is a name. And if you don't believe him, just say their name right now. Your mics are off. Say it out loud. Say the name of the person that you love right now, and you'll see what I mean, what Lacan means. That when you say the name of the person that you love, you can feel it in your bones. You've crossed a threshold of the utmost importance. That's what happens when you say their name. And let me tell you, if you say their name and you don't feel that, it probably ain't love. So what is psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis is a search for your object A, for the cause of your desire, for that bodily scrap of you that allowed you to appear as a split subject. This is not your sense of self, but the cause of your desire in the field of the other. which brings us to the analyst. The analyst is someone who has marched 
and merged their desire back into this irreducible A that they have always been. For those of you that are interested in psychoanalysis because you're clinicians, the discourse of the analyst is relevant here. It's in seminar 17. And as promised, I have a whole series of lectures that I'm gonna post soon on 17, step by step, page by page, almost like what we've been doing here, except worse. This in 17 is the discourse of the analyst. A for analyst here, <laughs> but not coincidentally a capital one. If you've studied 17, you know that this is the position of the speaker. This is the position of the person or entity they're sp speaking to. This is what's produced by that moment of addressivity. And here's how we read this. The analyst has marched themselves back to the cause of their desire. And they show up as it. They have assumed the position of the cause of their desire. And that's the position from which they speak to you. There's a reason why Lacan sometimes had his barber show up and cut his hair in analysis. Why he had a tailor show up and measure the length of his arms in the middle of a session. The analyst has marched their desire back to and merged themselves with its cause. And that's the position from which they're gonna speak to you, not as ego, but as split subject. And what they're asking you to do with S1 is name it. Name here means a new master signifier. Say it again, say it better, give us the narrative, name your lack. This is how we read the discourse of the analyst. The analyst speaks to the split subject in front of them and asks them to name their desire. The same way that I just told you that only by naming one's object cause, by coming to terms with it, can we move beyond the limit of anxiety. Here's the difference. S2, as you know, if you've studied 17, means knowledge. It, however, is in the position of truth here. Here's your addressor, here's your addressee, here's what's produced, and here's the position of truth from which this individual speaks. What is the knowledge that the analyst withholds? What is their hidden truth when they show up as the object cause of their own desire? And by extension, yours. It's this knowledge that comes with the name. And what I would suggest is that in this moment, when desire has been marched back and merged into its object cause, it's precisely in this moment that you steal back from the big other what they've taken from you. This is that jouissance at the level of the drive that we saw as the third turn in this dialectic of desire, anxiety, and jouissance. If desire shows us once more, moving from castration as cut to object A as opening, and anxiety reverses that, forcing your object A to cough up its original truth, of castration, 
Jouissance, again, is that reversal. A reclamation, if you will, of object A. That's what we see here. The analyst is somebody who has reclaimed the object cause of their desire in a field of partial objects that is them and knows this. About themselves. Knows this about themselves. Reclaimed it from anxiety in order to enjoy it at the level of the drive. That's how I would put this. Pushing past anxiety is about reclaiming the cause of your desire in order to enjoy it at the level of the drive. For the remainder of our time, I want to open the floor to conversation, to talk. It can be talk about what you've just heard. It can be questions. It can be comments. It can be talk about where we're going to go from here. But the floor is open. We've got about 15 more minutes. And as you know, I always am willing to stick around a few minutes afterwards as best I can. So if the in the analyst discourse, is that to say, I wonder, or to suggest that to be the analyst, you one has to have completed the circuit for themselves, or are they assuming the position of the analyst as if they had completed that circuit and reclaimed their own object? Like is it's must have traversed the, the gap themselves? Yeah, I, I think the answer. The Lacanian answer is yes, they have to have. And what that would mean is that I think this is part of the reason why training to become a Lacanian psychoanalyst requires that you yourself undergo Lacanian psychoanalysis. So you have to go through Lacanian psychoanalysis to come out on the other side and be able to treat patients. I don't know the full details of this and how this procedure works, but it is part and parcel of what it means to become one of these professionals is that you have to undergo the very analysis that would allow you to move from a desire for recognition, which is how the ego operates, to a recognition of your desire at the level of its cause. We know what we all want. What we all want is recognition and celebrity and money and stuff and fill in the blank, right? Why we want it is a totally different question. It's not a question of objectivity, the stuff that we want. It's a question of objectality, why we want it. What is the cause of my desire? Well, I want it because I don't have it. In analysis, what you're asked to do is to pass from the objective field of constantly searching for recognition from others to a causal field where you're looking at and trying to recognize not what you want, but why you want it. What was taken from me all those years ago that produced this experience of lack that I am now trying to satisfy by, I don't know, putting shit in my mouth, picking my teeth, becoming a dentist, insisting on oral sex. Fill in the blank. Choose your bodily opening. And the one that is the one that 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 uh, that dominates your life is probably going to be the one that if you push it hard enough, will take you back to a very embodied experience where some part of you or the other that is embodied was um, cast out. So if you, for instance, have um, like an invocatory drive. Like if it's all about music and sound and you're the kind of person like I, can walk around, I walk around San Francisco sometimes. It's so damn loud. It's so damn crazy. Fools be screaming, doing all kinds of shit. I just put earplugs in. And even that doesn't help with the sounds of traffic in this city. I'd sometimes just walk around with earplugs. I'll forget that I have earplugs in. 
and I'm just like walking around because I can't handle all that noise. You see? So here I am trying to fill the opening that is my erogenous zone here known as the ear. Now, I'm not saying that my drive is an invocatory one because we can have multiple drives, but there's usually one I would say that's dominant. Your scopic, oral, anal, or vociferic. And there you have it. And the idea is that through analysis, you would be able to march back to whatever that cause was and come to terms with it. Even in the early 50s, when Lacan is working up what it means to be a psychoanalyst and what it means to undergo psychoanalysis, he has this very explicit orientation that this is a talking cure. And the reason why that matters is one, because the medium of psychoanalysis is speech. It is spoken discourse. But two, it matters because psychoanalysis operates at the level of the name. To come to terms with someone's issue is to name it and to help them name it, to name your no-nos. That's kind of what we're up to here. At least that's how I read Lacan in this final push towards the name. The psychoanalyst or the discourse of the analyst is a discourse that is performed by somebody who has a name for their no-no, who has come to terms with it. And I think, yes, in terms of training, part and parcel of Lacanian psychoanalytic training is to undergo that analysis so that you can very honestly assume the position. Yet, though, Kaim, what I would say is, you know there are some motherfuckers that pretend. And it's probably not that hard to show up and just play that part for your patient. Act as if, right? Because it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it makes sense. And then it just brings me to the question of the end of analysis almost, but to, um, you know, what does that look like? Is it simply that I have recognized the cause, but I may still enact, right? I may still be possessed of the symptom, or is it that I have transcended the symptom and I've deleted Instagram and I'm just, you know, happy-go-lucky doing my thing and I don't, I'm no longer possessed of it. And I suspect it's the former that, right, like I'm aware of it. Maybe I haven't stopped doing all the weird shit, right? Like I'm Freud and I haven't stopped doing cocaine and telling people I know everything, but I at least know what it's about and I can tell you, help you find yours. Yep, totally. We're, we're not, I mean, I, I don't think the end of analysis produces this like, er, this extra worldly free of desire being. And that that's partly why Lacan is, is oftentimes down on the Zenist tradition. He's like, this whole idea of like getting beyond desire and desire being an illusion. He's like, fuck that noise. There is a traversing of fantasy that has to happen. But that doesn't mean that you stop desiring. And if you really dig into the Zenist tradition and the Buddhist tradition, those fools will tell you. The, the meditating monk shivers when they're cold. Their stomach growls when they're hungry. Sometimes they fall asleep while meditating. They are real embodied beings. The difference is, is that they're cool with it. We're not. When we're trying to meditate and our minds start to chatter and we get all monkey-brained and shit, we're harsh. We're like, come on, man, get it together. This is our time to meditate. What the fuck? We're hard on ourselves. The end of analysis is the occasion for love. But what I would suggest is that that love is twofold. It is first a love of self that we now talk about as self-compassion. And that is a forgiveness for the times when you just find yourself back on Instagram. You haven't deleted that shit, but you find yourself back. In fact, I know somebody who's very dear to me who regularly deletes her Instagram account or deactivates it. And I asked her, I said, I said um, she's like, I'm not going to delete it. She's like, let's be real. She's like, I just need to take a break from that shit. So she's not one of these people that's going to make the move of saying, and I'm done and I'll never do that again. And I'm healed and I'm no longer, as you said, possessed of the symptom. 
I'm in charge now, which is just a setup for failure. I feel like the end of analysis as I envision it is, um, is one of like a kind of easygoing contentment and a kind of acceptance of your foibles, your failures. Don't forget phallus and failure go hand in hand. It's a kind of acceptance of the fact that you're castrated and that when you stumble, it doesn't produce anxiety, but instead a bit of a chuckle. And that kind of compassionate relationship to the self where you accept your split subjectivity, I think is what enables this second part of love, which is the end of analysis too, in my view, which is an ability to accept that in others too. I'm not perfect and you don't have to be either. We can both be fucked up together. And that doesn't mean that like you fill my cracks and I fill yours. A good relationship in this viewpoint would be one where your rough edges don't aggravate my rough edges. We're able to work together in a way that you don't make, you don't bring out the worst in me and I don't bring out the worst in you. Like say what you will. And I know kind of this is a topic that you know a lot about. Um, there are people around whom we want to drink. I don't know what it is about these people, but when we're around them, it's like, and I want to drink when I'm with that person. It's not okay to blame them for the return of that habit, if you will. But there's a very strange way in which the other can be a cause for something in the self. And to be okay with that, man, okay, I'm going to fuck up. So um, my dad is an addict, and he'll always tell you that. He still goes to NA. He's like 70 years old, and he's still out in it all the time. And he'll just tell you if you ask him, but he's not going to talk your ear off about it. That's private shit. That's for him to work on. But he'll be the first to tell you that I'm an addict, and I'm always going to be an addict. And he starts there. And then he's cool. He knows he's going to fuck up. Sobriety is a great test, but um, so also is what you do when, when you lapse. After you lapse, I should say. Um, but that's, that's um, almost neither here nor there.